everybody, welcome to this session. So my name is uh, Klaus. Um, I'm, as you can tell from my accent, from the, the UK. So I'm from London. Uh, and I run an organization called Plant Based News. So this organization talks a lot about food security and how we can take the agricultural practices that we kind of know in theory and how we can scale them up economically. Um, and I'm really excited about today's, uh, today's session. Uh, which is called Building Climate Resilience Through Food Security. So uh, if you're a panelist, please join the, join the stage. We've got an amazing uh, array of speakers today and experts. Um, thank you so much for coming up. So first up, thank you so much for being here. It's, it's great to, to connect. Um, sorry. So thank you so much for, for doing this. A really impressive set of experts we, we have today. I think it might be easier rather than me kind of reading for, you know, people probably get bored of my voice. It'd be good if we go around, just introduce each other, um, just try and keep it short. Um, but yeah. If we, if we maybe go from the end and the left, yeah. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Keisha Farnham. I am the Director for Public Sector Projects with the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator, CCSA. And our organization was specifically designed to bring new financing to the region for climate smart projects. One of our pillars, which is 30 by 30 ocean protection and nature-based solutions, also includes climate smart agriculture. Um, our other pillars that we work across are renewable energy, the creation of green jobs, um, economic resilience through the creation of green jobs, and our most recently launched climate smart map. We launched it on Friday last week, actually, here at COP. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Tali Salumbaravi. I'm currently project coordinator for the Dagmo Women's Club. Um, that's based in Fiji, um, yeah, and I'm from Fiji as well, so a lot of the stocks around here. Um, what we do is try to, you know, just for adaptations and mitigation efforts, uh, especially for women's club, the ones who are really affected by climate change. Um, we have a small land ba uh, mess back at home, and um, whatever is happening here, whatever decisions are, yeah, so it kind of directly impacts uh, the local communities that I serve in, and I, that's where I'm from, Inaka. Talofa, everyone. I'm Karen Mapusua. I've got two hats. I'm president of iFirm Organics International, who the umbrella body for organic agriculture worldwide. And I'm also director of land resources division of the Pacific community, which supports the 22 countries and territories of the Pacific with agriculture and forestry development. And I live in Fiji. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tracy Mitchell. I'm, uh, I work with RTI International. Um, we are a research organization based in the U.S. that uses science to improve the human condition. Um, I'm our director of resilience and climate adaptation. I work in our international development group, so supporting um, projects um, across the globe. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Samer Taha, CEO of uh, Atoko. It's a deep tech company working on a new class of uh, atmospheric water harvesting uh, solutions. So I'm here hoping to shed light on um, the special severity of climate change impact on islands from the water scarcity perspective. Um, good morning, everyone. I am Alfredo M. Coro II. I'm a municipal mayor from the Philippines in the island of Siargao. I'm also here on behalf of Coastal 500. It is an organization of mayors that across the equatorial belt and we have presence in Honduras, Brazil, uh, Indonesia, Mozambique, uh, Philippines, uh, Palau, and uh, Micronesia. We are trying to share expertise and experiences of the different local government setup to allow stable fishing to thrive in our coastal shores. Thank you very much, everybody. So let's start with, with Keisha. Um, what are some of the agricultural practices in your specific area in the Caribbean um, that are being designed and implemented and rolled out to withstand climate-related challenges? 
I think I want to take a step back before I answer that question and just kind of frame what the challenges are for us in the region. Um, we are massively dependent on food imports. Um, according to the FAO, we import about 80% of our food, and that's a lot. Um, you know, we have small populations, yes, but we're also big tourism markets. So we're importing a lot of the food that people want to have when they're there, but we're also feeding larger populations at certain times of the year, even though our population size is small. Then you take into consideration the size of the island. So yes, we're big ocean states, but when you're talking about farming, you know, what's the arable land that's available? And depending on the topography of some of the islands, arable land is less apparent than others. The volcanic islands tend to have better arable land. The islands that have been, you know, um, years and years of coral and, and sandstone and stuff, it's not as arable as, as, as the volcanic, volcanic islands. Um, and I think, of course, layer on a hurricanes. I mean, we've all heard about that, the climate change impacts. Um, we have lots of flooding, hurricanes, et cetera, that impacts the food system as well. But I think one of the things that is very rarely talked about, but actually has a huge impact in the way that people perceive agriculture and needs to be addressed in order for any type of change to happen is the colonial legacy and plantocracy and how people who live in the Caribbean view agriculture. Nobody wants their kid to go into agriculture. And that has also impacted the way the school system forms and treats agriculture as well. So in terms of the curriculum, it's always considered the thing you do when you can't do the other things, right? Um, and so that also social mindset change also needs to happen. So now that I've created the frame, in terms of the types of interventions that we're looking at in the region, when you think about innovation, innovation is a continuing scale, right? And innovation can also mean the reimagination of all ways of being and doing, but it could also mean bright, new, shiny technology. Um, you know, having data sets, being able to monitor things via AI, etc. For CCSA, the ultimate nexus of innovation is a combination of those two things, right? Um, so if we can design projects that reimagine the old ways of doing things, so using regenerative farming practices, um, organic farming practices, you know, our, our ancestors have been doing this stuff for years, right? And so how could we build on what they've been doing and the way that they've been living with nature, add technology to it, and scale and amplify? And so that's how we look at our project development. Um, in particular, we would have just launched this year a Climate Smart Agriculture project um, pilot across three islands, so Anguilla, um, and Min uh, Minister Quincy of Marie Gums was just the most amazing advocate for the project. Cayman Islands, and I, I saw somebody from Cayman in the room as well, um, and Barbados. And it's basically a modular hydroponic growing unit. It can grow up to th 395 pounds of food per year. Um, you're looking at a 10 by 10 unit could literally be plugged into the wall, so it's very low on electricity consumption. By the way, electricity in the region, incredibly expensive. Very low water consumption. Water is very scarce as well. Um, but the units are so easy and simple that kids in schools can put them together. But then they also have the added advantage of being daisy chained together to create a commercial size production. Um, and so we've been working with this organization called Fork Farms out of the US um, with the, our different government partners. And the Cayman Islands love the idea so much that within the first year, I'm sorry, the first month of yield, they committed to doing an additional 20 units and scaling it out to all the schools in the Cayman Islands so that the kids have access to a different type of agriculture, understanding that agriculture is not just tied to servitude or, you know, like hard work in the fields, but it's an innovative way to do things as well. Wow. Just, and, uh, it's fascinating. Just as a follow-up to anyone, really, I'm sure you've all got an opinion on this, like how can we integrate technology into uh, our systems? Because you made a really good point. We have been farming for tens of thousands of years, but now we're in a situation where there's 8 billion people on the planet. So how do we walk that tightrope of using technology um, in an appropriate, robust, um, measured way? I don't know if anyone has got it. Yeah. Um, let me share a, a small experience we have in our island. So I'm 
one of the first recipients of the Climate Survival Fund of the Philippines. So it's a very innovative financing mechanism that supports adaptation projects. And in, in our project, it's a climate field school that focuses on farmers and fisher folks to use available data so that we could pinpoint specifically when to plant, plant, where to plant, and what type of plants are you going to plant. Expecting a specific type of yield so that your risk as a farmer or as a fisherman, the same with the same concept, uh, will be lower and therefore you have higher potential family income. Uh, currently, we're exploring because we the Philippines launched its first few sets of satellites. So we have now satellite data from space and we are now trying to incorporate space data with agromet data to come up with a new set of data sets to be able to address what we hope to achieve, which is basically really to lower the risk of farmers and fishermen because they are risk tolerance and risk averse. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I just want to share one example um, that we've been doing at RTI, and that's around applied climate modeling. And so the, the things that these traditional systems and farming <laughs> systems have been doing for, for centuries, you know, may not be fully adapted to what, um, what the new climate is going to bring. And so there are certainly climate models, but we've been applying those climate models to, um, to hydrology systems, to cropping systems to really advise farmers on whether the crops that they've been producing will be viable in the future, or how will water access change in the future. And so really using data and technology to inform those traditional systems, I think is really a key technology that, that can change things. We've got a, a couple of really interesting examples happening in the Pacific as well. Vanuatu has recently uh, launched an app which anyone can access and it's about the indicator species for weather events. Uh, so based on traditional knowledge that's been gathered, it's all available in an app. Uh, farmers, anyone else can access that and when they see an unusual bird or something happening to a plant that they're not used to, they can check and see if that is traditionally an indicator for a climate related event. It also allows the, the information to grow. There's a citizen science component so people can also input into that and we build the data set in an ongoing way. Another really great opportunity that we have of combining sort of new science with traditional science is around genetic resources. So we've got the, the gene bank for the Pacific in Fiji, which has all our important food security crops in vitro. Um, so we have the genetic data for that, the taxonomy data for that, but we're also hoping to be able to gather the traditional knowledge around each of those crops, around the way it's planted, what it's used for, what companion plants were planted in it, so that we don't lose it. And when we send crops out to a country uh, for them to plant, we can also give them that full range of information for farmers to utilise. So I think there's a huge range of ways we can combine these two and rem remember that it's all technology. Um, it's not just the new technology, the, the traditional technology is just as critical. Um, I'll just say an example of um, a project that we're working on. Um, so it's a, it's a biodigester. Um, so with the given landmass, small landmass that we have back at home, um, so our green wa waste we turn it into cooking fuel and also contributes to um, the biofertilizer that um, contributes to their farming. So it, it helps, you know, circular economy and also for the women, um, for a sugarcane farming um, area, um, this really helped a lot in, um, in our food security. So yeah, uh, we really need a lot of uh, those innovations in, especially for local communities like ours. Uh, do, do you have anything that comes to mind, Sama? Yeah, I would like to come back to water. Yeah. So um, if, if we look at farming and we want to make this farming regenerative and sustainable, from technical perspective, you need to look at the resources you are utilizing. And this includes soil, land, water, energy, maybe fertilizers, and so on. So. Um, water scarcity is one of the most severe consequences of climate change. And some experts actually say that climate change problem is a water problem. Um, so in our view, to have sustainable farming, whether this farm 
produces crops or livestock, uh, you need to have uh, sustainable and eco-friendly water supplies. And in the context of islands, um, they, they really have a special case because if you have small islands and you're facing water scarcity, then your options are limited. Either you import water from outside, which can be costly or cause um, security or national security risk, or you desalinate uh, the water. And this comes at, of course, potential CO2 emissions. But even if you use renewable energy, you have a brine disposal. And in, when, when you have a small island, that represents uh, severe risk on marine life. So when we think about it uh, from our perspective, from our company's perspective, we find that atmospheric water harvesting technology uh, has really uh, very high potential, especially in the context of small islands facing water scarcity. What many people don't know that uh, the atmosphere holds around 10 times the f fresh water of all rivers combined on, on the surface of Earth. And it's a renewable source of water, of course. What we are bringing in terms of innovation is we are trying to develop a new class of w atmospheric water harvesting solutions that is efficient to the point that it can work passively completely. So by harvesting solar and even ambient temperature, we can cycle uh, the adsorbed moisture from the from air and produce clean and fresh water on a daily basis. So this is a, an innovation we are hoping that will contribute to the future. I've, I've got a question on, on water. Um, how much of the problem is um, the innovations that we use and how we do certain agricultural practices versus just what we consume? Um, is, is the elephant in the room maybe what we consume rather than perhaps tinkering around the edges, trying to work out more efficient ways of doing it? Um, and, and maybe you could explain like what are the products and what are the ways we as consumers, either on a top top down level or bottom up grassroots level, what we can do in terms of what is the most efficient products in terms of water consumption? Um, if you look at the consumption side, if I got your question correctly, um, I think here, you know, data sensing is very important because when you have feedback, you can continuously, of course, optimize water consumption. So in the context of farming, having you know, efficient irrigation, very efficient irrigation is very important. And things like even satellite sensing or uh, land-based sensors, uh, big data analysis will help us to optimize to the maximum. And in some, in some cases, we have seen optimization that exceed 90%, meaning we are able to irrigate by using 10% of traditional amount of water when you do it in an optimized way. Um, so this is definitely, of course, uh, an angle that's very important. But no matter how much you optimize with population growth, with climate disruption to water pattern, you always need to find a sustainable and uh, environment-friendly way to generate water. Uh, yes. I just want to add one thing. Um, there's like a third component, I think, that we don't talk enough about, and that's food waste. Um, so if you think that 30 to 70 percent of the food that we produce with that very scarce water is wasted, um, you know, in addition to changing consumer behavior and in addition to being more effective with how we are efficient with how we use the water, reducing food waste, um, I think, is possibly the, the biggest area for improvement. And I guess you, you can tap the amazing thing of food waste that I think it accounts for 5% of global greenhouse gas emissions is hugely significant. Um, there's a call to action for both consumers and uh, businesses there to take action, I think, and that's what's really empowering about it. Um, Alfredo, I want to talk about um, uh, local solutions and local action. The UN is finally pushing for local climate action. Can you talk about the, what, what this means um, and and the, maybe the challenges with, with um, local climate action? Um, from my side, I'd like to talk about policy, as we have already water and everything else. Sure. Um, and we're just glad that for the first time in 28 years, um, COP finally recognized that everything is local. No matter what policy we do, no matter what science we have, the implementation will always be local. And that's where sustainability of the local actions and the impacts 
are most effective if there is policy components to it. Unfortunately, for most of our rural areas, not the cities, but the small rural communities and uh, villages in, in each of our islands that where we live in globally, we have a lack of this capacity to recognize that at the potential policy that will allow us to sustainably manage the resources that we have. And I think this is, the, this is an oppor opportunity for many of the experts that we have to consider if there are programs and projects that you implement. Consider the policy aspect. How will the local governments convert all the actions into a policy so that it's sustained, there will be regular financing, to such a time that you are able to scale up as a response to the issues that are being raised. So in terms of local action, that's the action that we hope to see. Because on the side of policy, we don't have the expertise. We sometimes actually fear writing the policy because we might be questioned on the policy itself. With, you know, when you don't have a background in law, you know, don't have a background in, in science, but you get elected as an official and you have that authority to make decisions in terms of um, finance, in terms of direction, in terms of vision, but you don't have that policy. So I, I suppose uh, my call to action would be, in terms of your question, is local action should be supported really by policy and we really hope that all programs will lead to such. Just, just on that aspect of, of water policy, um, a couple of examples come to mind. We work across 28 Caribbean countries. We have 28 Caribbean countries in our membership, uh, the Dutch, the French, the Spanish, and the English-speaking Caribbean. Many of them are categorized as water scarce countries. But when you look at the policy, the government policy on collection of water, it actually prohibits farmers, individual household owners to collect water. So a couple of them have actually made that change and it's made a significant difference. And it did take it did take, you know, public consultations, of course, you know, the water authority, etc. But for example, Barbados just recently changed their water collection and allowing you to harvest rainwater. And it has implications for so many other industries, not only just agriculture. Um, so definitely that whole aspect of being able to use the resources that are already there by just changing the policy. And it took probably like about six months to change that policy. And I know that in um, the Dutch islands, the ABC islands, they've also done similarly. Um, they've also had tweaks to their policy in terms of water storage, which allowed them to onboard um, air, uh, water from air technology, um, because actually the policy didn't allow for them to have storage for water from air technology. And it's, it's, it's really sometimes when that policy is written, all the eventualities we're not present at that point in time. So it's really just kind of looking at this archaic, you know, archaic policies that we might have and saying, how can we fix this so that we allow technology to take its rightful place, but also practical solutions like rainwater harvesting. Thank you very much. Um, I was, go ahead. Um, okay, I've got a question. Um, how does empowering women at grassroots level contribute to building a more resilient and sustainable food system, uh, especially in the context of climate change? Menaka, um, when we talk about resilience, we talk about women. Um, as a mother, um, climate resilience, we have a lot of uh, hurricanes back at home. And uh, whenever we have, uh, after the cyclone, um, the only, you know, children run to the mothers. I mean, that's in our Pacific, um, yeah, and I think it's everybody. Um, so for, for us, um, there's a lot of um, things that uh, surrounds women. Um, they have challenges, they have on their own, but being resilient when it comes to, when it comes to food, when it comes to you know, providing uh, something for their loved ones, you know, we do what we can as a mother myself. Um, so, you know, by empowering them, um, it's, a, it's a holistic strategy and integrates, you know, all dimensions. Um, so, for me, because um, I, I represent, I work with a lot of women back at home. And um, the, the more, um, you know, looking at it, um, you know, women are the primarily the custodians of uh, family households. They are the ones that, even though they are the ones that make decisions. 
um, concerning the f food system and whatever they they decided in the le level. Um, so yeah, uh, for, uh, for me, empowering them, it's not just about um, you know, it's about um, them as a, as uh, as a woman, but you know, you you are empowering you are you know for the knowledge transfers. Um, it's empowering the next generation. So yeah, empowering them, providing them with the right resources. I'm sure, definitely sure that they will excel. And with the project that's currently happening, uh, we when we started, uh, because in a specific culture, women are all uh, don't get recognized um, in decision makings. Even in some, um, I would say, village meetings, they are not allowed to speak. So, you know, with the impact that we have, with the, with the project that we have back at home, uh, I've seen the changes. Um, so, you know, by empowering these women, they continue to empower others. So, yeah, um, it, it kind of went right, with our project, it went right into policy level changes. So, yeah, when I said empowering women, it's empowering the next generation, Vinaka. Maybe it'd be interesting to understand the specific provisions that you oh. created and the specific project yeah. that led um, to what you're saying, because I think okay. I'm, I'm um, certainly with, interested. Sorry, with the project that we have right now, uh, because of our area, um, okay, um, Kavewa is um, located near the Great Sea Reef. Um, if uh, Great Sea Reef is the longest <laughs> reef in the world. So um, with our project, it has helped um, you know, uh, support circular economy. Um, also, with our food system, they have their their farms in in that small area of. Um, we have around 19.5 uh, square kilometer of the island, so yeah, it's relatively small. And um, with that, um, we also with the group, um, we have also have. Um, I would, um, uh, we've uh, participated in mangrove restoration uh, because it helps, you know, because for us, um, just like you have banks when you go to, we go to our ocean. Our ocean is our natural capital. So with, um, with whatever the, the women, when they, they drive all these, um, all these initiatives and, um, you know, it's just for, for our food security. Um, they have, um, you know, one of the the project that we had, um, like uh, we developed, uh, we um, did an MPA. That's a marine protected area, and um, it protects the nesting um, site of turtles. Um, it's one of the top nesting uh, turtle nesting site in Fiji, and uh, you know, uh, for us, uh, turtles is a traditional icon. Um, only before only chiefs are, you know, it's only. Uh, allowed to eat, so um, right after, then you know it's it's a it's a sacred uh, it's a sacred animal for us. So with the um, with the project that we ha that are happening back at home, um, so it it kind of protects all this stuff around here, like the it contributes to our a great sea reef, uh, the protection of it, um, biodiversity conservation. Yeah, so yeah, I think like I said, it's empower when we empower women. We empire what everyone. Vinaka. Uh, got a question for Karen. Uh, how do you envision, envision the role of international cooperation in promoting organic agriculture as a tool for climate resilience and food security? Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's uh, probably three main areas, and one, I guess, is the obvious one. Uh, it's around capability sharing, um, learning from each other, and facilitating that. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge and experience out there. Frequently, it isn't well shared, and frequently, it's not shared in the right way. Farmer to farmer learning is the most powerful way for getting change on a farm. Um, a lot of farmers in the Pacific will chase away an extension officer because they don't believe what they're saying, but they will listen to another farmer. Um, yeah, so we're seeing examples of that spring up um, within countries, but also across borders. We have in the Pacific a regional network of organic learning farms, and international cooperation allows us to, to move those farmers around the region and share knowledge and experience with each other. As I'll talk about the other one, which really is the big one on international cooperation, and it's access to finance. For farmers to convert their farming systems, they need long-term support, not a three-year project cycle. It takes time and it has to be based on a proper business case for that farm. 
on my Facebook feed this morning, a memory popped up from COP24 in Poland, where we had a side event of farmers' voices from SIDS talking about organic agriculture and regenerative agriculture. From that side event, um, some commercial farmers came to me and said, we need a project to help us convert. We drafted a program that is for GCF funding. It goes to the board next year, so that's year five, and funding will come through if it's approved six years after that idea. So we talk about the slow onset of climate impacts. We have slow onset climate financing to match, and it's simply not good enough for what we need to support our farmers to transition into sustainable production systems. Is that, is that one of the reasons Sri Lanka had some issues? Because uh, I've got some family in Sri Lanka, and I think a couple of years ago they tried to go 100% organic. Was it related to fina finance? That was, uh, that was a complex situation. That was a political decision by the government, which was an economic decision with no planning around it. Um, so to convert to organic farming takes a period of time. It takes support. If you're in a heavily... Um, input-based production system, you will lose production for the first three years or so. Uh, unfortunately, that was an overnight decision by the government of Sri Lanka against all advice. We did advise them not to do it that way. And of course, it had impacts. Um, yeah, so it just, just takes time and planning, but then the finance needs to go alongside that. Um, just segueing into finance as well. Um, you know, we were designed as an organization to bring additional private sector financing and philanthropy to the region. Um, and there are a couple of things that we're realizing, that we realized very early on in terms of scale. So when you're talking about private sector financing um, and bankability of projects, you know, venture capitalists, impact investors, they want to do good and do well. Don't forget the do well part, it's still a business. So they want to have impact, but they want to be able to invest in businesses that make sense. And what we realize is that a lot of the projects in the Caribbean, because the scale of individual islands is so small, um, it's not really worth the time and investment for, for um, private sector. What we have found is that by creating economies of scale, because I mean, most of the islands have the same issues. So if we could create economies of scale and create projects that have multiple islands involved and they're doing something similar with the, with the partner, it then makes it easier to track financing. Um, but 100% agreed that the fit for purpose financing that's needed to get farmers to the next stage that is the missing link. Um, one of the things we're doing as an organization is next year, we're well, we've already started the process, but we'll be launching our innovation fund next year. And it's specifically to, to, to bridge that gap, particularly within the areas that are, that are difficult to fund. Um, so of course, adaptation projects, but also climate smart agriculture, conservation, those kinds of things, helping them to get to the stage where they can approach uh, and get private sector investment or access philanthropy. Uh, yeah, please, please. One more brief thing. Um, on the, the policy piece, IFIRM has a, an organic policy toolkit that's available online and also facilitates a network of policy makers to share best practice. Because you do come into office and then all of a sudden you're being asked to do these things and there's often little support, but there is a lot of best practice out there and so accessing those networks to make the most of that is really important. Uh, yeah, but uh, Tracy uh, yeah. first, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to add one thing that, that we're beginning to see as a real opportunity for, for farmers globally, and that's using, um, using carbon markets as an additional source of finance. You know, farmers that are, that are using regenerative practices, that are sequestering carbon in the soil, carbon is becoming, in, in, in some, some countries, such as the United States, and hopefully in others, a new crop for farmers. Um, selling that carbon um, sequestration. Um, we've, we've just now this year started working with um, dairy farmers in Ethiopia to produce low methane intensity milk so that they can tap into carbon markets and receive a payment for that. So as farmers globally begin to, um, to use these climate smart practices, um, they should be getting a payment for that. And that payment coming generally from the mitigation side can be funding their adaptation and I think that's just a super promising area for us to tap into. But I know there was just a global stock take of um, carbon credits for the agriculture sector. 
and only five of those projects are unfortunately in less developed countries. And so for all of us to start, it's hard to do, to start understanding it and getting behind it and do it, I think there's huge opportunity. So I just want to segue on that one, but more on the, the action of the now uh, in terms of policy. just want to share with everyone, like for example, in the Philippines, in terms of fishery, we have, uh, we are, we, in our law, we have control, the local governments have control of a 15 kilometer um, shoreline uh, that allows us to have our artisanal fisher folks have direct access. And this practice and policy was shared to Honduras. Then we have four of our mayors that are part of Coastal 500 that realized, yeah, so if, we, if you are allowed to do that in your country, why are we not allowed to do that in our country? Then they started working with their parliament and we have the four municipalities now have control of their own 12, kilo, uh, 12 nautical miles. And they're now working with parliament to have the whole country and the shoreline be allowed access only to artisanal fisher folks in the 12 nautical miles. So what I'm saying is, if there are practices out there that are already available, there has to be a way that we could share these policies to every small local government out there that has no access to these policies. And if they implement it, we might not need that much financing to have impactful changes in our communities. Great. Well, we've got three and a half minutes left, so I just want to say thank you so much for, for taking part. Um, I want to go around in less than a minute or 30 seconds each. I've never, I've never asked this as a, as a panel host, but I'm just going to put it out there. Um, what is your message to the world, lastly, in less than 30 seconds? And if you're not sure what to say, where can people find out more about your work? Okay, I'll start first. So maybe in 30 seconds uh, on what the is line. What is your message to the world in less than 30 seconds? Yeah, my message to the world is, as I said, climate change is a, is a water problem. And uh, continuation of the policy discussion, there has to be also similar to the carbon subsidy and carbon market, um, also consideration that there has to be a policy around what is the environmental impact of water generation. If you produce a liter of water, consume, uh, emitting CO2 or emitting brine to the ecosystem, there has to be a penalty for that, and there has to be incentives for those who generate water in a clean way, sustainable way, that is also has no environmental impact. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yep. Um, I guess mine would be that um, once farmers understand the science behind um, the climate crisis, I think the solution to it is going to be farmers. Um, you know, we've seen incredible progress with renewable energy, and I would say in the next five years, we're going to see tremendous progress from the agriculture sector contributing to climate solutions. Right. 1.5 to stay alive. We have to do absolutely everything for that target, and there's a lot of that to do in the agriculture sector, and the COP isn't doing enough. Yeah, and I'll just say, even if we eliminate fossil fuels immediately, unless we change our food, we, we can't save in 1.5. That, that's my message to the world. Al Alfredo, what's, what's your message? You first. Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. All sorry. right. Um, I'll just message to the world. Uh, like our Metro card says, uh, let's walk together um, for the common good. Um, yeah, so um, at the co-op venue, what legacy you want to leave? That's, that's a question to all ourselves. Like, ask ourselves, what legacy you want to leave, Benaka? I think the agricultural uh, food system cannot be solved, that crisis cannot be solved in isolation. When we look at project development, we need to understand the intersectionality. Energy, food, there's no separation. Energy, people, food, no separation. Energy, people, education, food, no separation. And we need to be looking at it from a very holistic point of view. Visit our Climate Smart map on our website, um, Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator. Google it. <laughs> just, just Let me close very quickly. All the, 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 just to take off from the intersections of uh, what our colleague is saying, everything is intersected at the local government level. All the silos of the different nationalities, uh, international donors, uh, national government, everything is uh, funneled in the local government. And if we capacitate our local governments, we'll be able I guarantee you will be able to transcend all these problems quickly and faster. Right. I think we've got, uh, thank you very much, everybody. Firstly, I think we've got a few minutes for Q&A. So has anyone got a question? 
Uh, yes. So if you ask a question, are you okay to just take a couple of photos on my phone, please? Thank you. <laughs> so first of all, I thought this was a stunning panel. Really deep and really, you know, heavy. It, it was really good. It wasn't superficial. Uh, real discussions. The poli I like uh, the focus on policy. And I like what you said about or what you said about uh, policymakers, networks, and using what's worked. I think it's also important to consider like unintended consequences and externalities. Like a, pro a policy that might sound good, like organic food, might have been tried somewhere in this way, and it had really bad impact. And I, my question is: Is there a global? Uh, climate policy database that somebody can tap into on their own and say, we want a new water policy. You, you do a search. The World Bank used to do amazing knowledge management on project solutions. You could go, you know, road repair and learn lessons. Is there a global climate <laughs> policy database? And maybe that's a longer term action item. Yeah. We have organizations um, for the first, for the last 10 years that have been working to do that so uh, in the in the many cops before everything was very high level yeah. national then slowly in the last few cops they've been sub nationals that were added and in fact for this cop for the first time we have the local uh, climate action summit where in the mayors were asking simply who are negotiating why are we not there when we are the ones implementing so hopefully in the next few years or months, I hope. Organizations like ours, the Coastal 500, ICLEI, uh, C40, many of these are already starting to share many of the best practices and policies that can be copied, replicated, implemented, tweaked to suit your local culture, your local knowledge, your local practices. I'll just add, so I think you identified like a really key point, and so Mark, that can be your call to action. Um, in the coming year, I know you're a governance expert, and um, it seems like that's something that is sorely needed and um, probably an oversight. Right. So any other questions from the audience? Uh, yes, on the, on the right. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. My, I, I come from Nigeria, and in the south part of the country, the oil companies are leaving. Why? Because there's a change in government policy and the world is turning to you know, net zero. The problem is the devastation that they've left behind is terrible. And most of the people that live in that coastal area can't even breathe clean air. No agricultural land to farm. The fishes are gone. So my question actually is to the gentleman uh, that's dealing on water. Does your technology helps in, you know, in such areas where the atmosphere is already polluted, you know, converting those you know, uh, to clean water. And the second question is, uh, the organization I represent, which is the Nigerian Center for Climate Renewal, Resilience and Adaptation, is actually looking at putting up a database of young headers between the ages of 18 to 40 in my country, because we are, we are worried about you know, the farmer's headers clash. And when you talked about carbon capture and what you're doing in Ethiopia, I felt that's something that we'll really you know, like to tap into. So I would just like to see how, I want to hear from you on the water side and also probably meet you after the event to talk about how we can collaborate together. Thank you. Right. And just, just in the interest of time, we've got one minute left, so. Okay, quickly, thanks for the question. Um, yes, indeed, uh, without getting into too much details, the technology we use is uh, designed with atomic precision. So the novel material that we use only absorb water molecules from air and produce 100% pure water. Um, and it, that's why it, we have an advantage also that we can work under very arid conditions at extremely low RH relative humidity, as low as 20%. That's, that's the difference because atmospheric water harvesting exists. It's not very new, but what's new is being very efficient and being able to operate at a very low relative humidity or polluted air. So that's a very brief answer for now. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for coming and uh, oh, thank you. A round of applause for our amazing panel. Thank you. Thank you.